Greens of Villiers is right, though, isn't she? This is about relationship counselling with Europe. It's not about uh, the nuclear option of divorce. Well, the problem is that we've tried 40 years to get reform of the European Union. It has failed. Reform requires 27 other countries all to agree. It isn't going to happen. It hasn't happened. It's time to be honest with the British people, say it's not working, and then accept one of two things. Either you take the approach that, you, that, that the UK should be a part of Europe and accept everything, sign up to the euro and, and, and the whole shebang, or you take the UK position and say you want to be good neighbours with Europe, trade freely with them, but not have European government. OK, well, there's been some evidence that your message is appealing to people, some good polling this week. Uh, there's three seats up for grab in the North East. What's your ambition? Well, I think looking at the opinion polls, we would be very, very disappointed if we didn't at least take one of those three seats. Uh, it's quite clear that across the north of England, the last few polls have showed UKIP on over 30% of the vote. One of those has had UKIP ahead of Labour. If that were true, then we'd even take two seats in the North East. So, I mean, that would be the, uh, the absolute ultimate dream for okay. us, but we're certainly doing very, very well indeed. Uh, Judith Curtin, darling, just over a week ago, uh, just a week uh, over a week ago, rather, you told me you weren't seeing much sign of UKIP support on the Labour doorsteps. No, we're Sticking not. Sticking to that? Well, in fact, it's a kind of uh, strange situation because um, we're looking at these polls which are, are coming out, but I think there's quite a lot of questioning about whether you can really take the polls fully seriously because our experience on the doorstep is really quite different. We're getting a really warm response um, as Labour candidates on the doorstep and, well, why, and every session is turning up. Um, there are UKIP voters. There are definitely UKIP voters in the North East. They're particularly in marginal seats for Labour um, and people who are feeling hit and want to do a protest vote. Why, why, the, why are there some of your leaflets this week had to go at UKIP policies if you're not particularly worried about them? We want to set out exactly what UKIP's putting forward as a political party because that, that's important in terms of transparency. So the UKIP agenda in terms of things which people hold dear in the North East is really needs to be exposed a little bit, like okay. privatisation of the NHS, Would like scrapping worker, workers' rights, like Would pulling back... Policy? Well, I think you are planning on scrapping... Uh, maternity leave uh, no, no. for well, it's in your manifesto, which um, I know you've you've denounced um, previously. But those, no, those all of we those positions are in that. are in the manifesto. So and then lower, 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 lower taxation, lower taxation for the rich. You're the party that parts for the poor. I mean, these are policies which UKIP have defended in the past. Nigel Farage is on record in the European Parliament on this. We've got a lot to discuss. I'm sure we'll come back to some of this. Well, the big issue for many of people in these elections is immigration. Ten years ago this week, Poland joined the European Union, allowing its citizens to work and live in our region. And this year, Romanians and Bulgarians also, of course, got those same rights. Now, UKIP says that's lowered wages, increased the benefits bill, put services under strain. None of you, I have to say, share by many migrants who say they're paying their taxes and doing the jobs sometimes that nobody else wants to do. We invited a UKIP candidate to meet one of them. Yes. Meet Gagana Ivanova. She's a Bulgarian working in an okay. Indian restaurant in Newcastle. It's that kind of world these days. Oh, so ready to go. Yeah. She's also a journalism student at Sunderland University and after her studies wants to stay in the UK. It's definitely more secure about everything and I don't mean the, the free treatments, I don't mean the benefits, but I mean that if you want to work, you can go out and find a job. But something too many migrants have arrived here in the last decade, including this man, UKIP European candidate Richard Elvin. So we've invited him to meet Gagana, tell her why, and explain posters like this. Our services currently can't cope, our schools, our hospitals, our housing, and we feel the time has come to have a moratorium on immigration until we can put our house in order. Everyone says is we, the migrants, we steal English people's jobs. We don't steal someone's job if we don't deserve it. I don't think that we infer that they steal jobs. When you have a massive oversupply of, of labour, it forces down the pay rates. That is one of the things that we're very concerned about, that it has driven down living standards. For the moment, though, the doors remain open to people like Mircea Teodor. A teacher in Romania is working as a carer in an old people's home in Middlesbrough. But he says he's not depriving anyone of a job. In my care home, uh, maybe more than 80% of uh, carers are foreigner. Romanian, uh, Thai, Chinese, Polish. It is not my... 
you know, my right to say this, but I think it's the truth. For me, it's the truth. English people don't want these jobs. Elena is also Romanian, but she's been here 20 years and now helps new arrivals like Mircea find their feet. She says most migrants are desperate to work. But although Mircea is being paid properly, she admits some may not be. I'm very honest here. I know families who is working from 9 o'clock morning to 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock for £17 a day and is still happy to be able to put the food on the table because a lot of them is not have knowledge what is the minimum wage here because the language barrier so there is prepared to talk to take the jobs no matter what but some who've been here longer might soon become employers themselves Edita and Margaret arrived from Poland around seven years ago now they don't just work in this Middlesbrough cafe they own it we settle here very well. Um, daughter is more English than Polish now. She she corrects me uh, with my English all the time. We bought a house here. We've we've made lots of friends, uh, and now here we are. We've got a our own business. The Polish community is a one uh, only one community who bring to the your budget about uh, 30 percent uh, money above than they got from the benefits. So they 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 pay their taxes. They have work, so we can we can be proud of, of ourselves with this. Some though are not convinced. Alistair Robertson is a UKIP voter from County Durham. He's concerned migration is stretching the services his taxes have funded. I've had very little time of work ever since I left school. I've been virtually fully employed all the way through. I've paid taxes, national insurance and everything. And other people are getting, who've never paid into the system just come in and get a free ride. I've got nothing against Romanian people or, uh, Bul or Bulgarian people. What I'm saying is that we can't cope with the numbers. But just how large are those numbers? The latest figures available date from December 2012, and they suggest that at that point there were around 12,000 people from Eastern Europe living in the northeast. That's less than half a percent of the region's population. But whatever the size of that migrant community, they appear to have become a big issue in this month's European elections. Well, let's turn to our aspiring MEPs. Uh, Jude Curtin-Darling, how would you answer the UKIP charge that mass migration has lowered wages, put a strain on services? I think there's um, a lot of misinformation around the debate around immigration and I think nationally, um, not just regionally, but nationally we need to have a more measured discussion about immigration and how we deal um, with our Are needs. Are they completely wrong? I think that there's a lot of scaremongering which um, feeds people's concerns, especially in a period where but a lot of people you, you are feeling insecure. Their, their descriptions of Romanians working for below the minimum wage Absolutely. in the black market. And that's where Labour's really focused on. So we're really putting forward a, a political agenda which is about tackling the exploitation. Because that's abuse by employers of abusing the rights that those workers have the right to. And that certainly pulls down... Um, wages for other people. We need to enforce the minimum wage much more. That means we need more inspections. It means we inf we need investment in the infrastructure. We need better penalties. We need better penalties for employers who don't pay or don't treat workers as they should okay. according to the law. And we all also need to, and you know, there are lots of these issues, I would just say Richard, lots of these issues are actually national policy issues. They have to be dealt with by a government. Okay. So we'll have to wait till the, the right. general okay. election. But the last point is no, European, no, 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 I'm, I'm going to move European on because I've got very limited time. I've got very limited time. Let's bring Jonathan Arnott. Jonathan Arnott, to make Jonathan Arnott. Uh, actually, the truth is that, as we saw, a lot of the people from Eastern Europe are here to pay taxes, to work, to make a good life for themselves. They're not here to put strain on our services, they're actually contributing. And in some ways that's true. I think that there is research that shows that for every 100 people uh, that come into the country of working age, that, uh, that an, the equivalent of 23 jobs are, are lost in, uh, in the UK as a, as a result. So there, is, you know, the, there are issues there. Um, I think what you also find is that when you've got a massive oversupply of people coming in prepared to do jobs at minimum wage or sometimes even below, that oversupply means that it's very, very difficult to find a job uh, at, but, uh, at minimum wage. But what, what about, about Merchant Mer Mer Theodore? He says, look, in his experience, British people don't want to do the job he's doing. Well, I think that's, that's a rather cynical approach to take, well, actually. It's, it's based on his experience. What, you work in a care home? But, but our experience on the doorstep 
and seeing people who are out of work is that they're, they're desperate to get any job that they can find. They really want to work. You know, and, and the idea that, that British people don't want to work is really doing, doing the British people down in a way, I think. And, and we should take a much more positive uh, approach than that. We okay. should reward hard work, which is our no tax on minimum I mean, wage policy. Yeah. You, 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 you yeah. have said that, that, you know, that, that UKIP's poster campaign, we saw part of it there, mm. in your view, is racist. No, um, I've never said that it's racist. Well, Labour's implied that, that it's no, certainly inflammatory. We've, we've impl we think that it's scaremongering. Yes. It's scaremongering, But a lot certainly. of public seem to agree with it when you look at polling. So who's right? Well, I think that there's a fear factor, and, and UKIP are playing on the politics of fear. I mean, let's look at the, the figures for the North East. We have a foreign-born population of 1.7%. That includes that 0.5% of Eastern Europeans. But our unemployment levels are far higher. It's not about um, migrant workers taking jobs um, off uh, local workers. It's about not enough jobs okay. in the North East okay. economy. And okay. the focus okay. should be on jobs Jonathan, in the North East economy. Uh, there is a danger here, isn't there? You might not yourself describe yourself as a racist, but by saying that if, if your wages are low, it's down to migration. If you can't get a job could be down to migration. Your services aren't very good, down to migration. That scapegoats a community and attracts racists. You see, that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is that the problem is that we've got unlimited immigration from Europe at the moment. And that's causing low wages. immigration from elsewhere. Costing so, jobs, as you've already said that. Look, what, what we should have is a system of work permits. We should have a system where those people who have skills, who will genuinely benefit the UK economy, who are taking jobs in areas where, frankly, uh, where, frankly, we need the skills, those should be the people who are allowed to come in. So we should have a fair policy that doesn't discriminate based on whether you're from Europe or not from Europe. It's ridiculous okay, to suppose. Just uh, very briefly. Yeah, I think the key thing to remember is that this is about a two-way street, EU migration. And there are two million Britons working in the rest of Europe or living or retired so or studying in the rest of Europe. And That's there are about true, two though. million Europeans living okay, and working right. and the, studying the, the in Britain. Sorry, 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 and that, those are we're, the we're official figures, Jonathan. The research on yesterday, on. Oxford University, we'll never get one to the truth of the figures, so I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. The EU, Thank you very much for in the UK. Uh, now, a new business park in concert, a low-carbon enterprise zone at the old Swan Hunter shipyard on the Tyne, and a fund to help new firms get going in Berwick. Just three of many projects paid for, in part, by European mo Union money. Now, Cumbria in the North East has done well in the past in the EU structural fund, but with more poorer countries joining, we're likely to get a smaller share in the future. Now, I met up with the European Union's Regional Policy Commissioner, Johannes Hahn, in Brussels, and asked him first what he thought the impact of such spending had been in the region. I mean, if I look in the figure, uh, North East must have benefited because uh, we have uh, created 11,000 jobs and we have even safeguarded more than 11,000 jobs and I think we have assisted more than 13,000 uh, 13, uh, SMEs. And uh, what has been done in the North East in the past is exactly what we would like to do and to see all over Europe to promote, to push the economy in order to create, to safeguard jobs. Nevertheless, the argument of people like the UK Independence Party is that Britain puts millions, hundreds of millions of pounds into the European Union. Some of that comes back to the North East. If Britain came out of the European Union, it could just keep that money and spend it anyway without passing it through a bunch of bureaucrats in Brussels. I would say the UKIP representatives should ask the representatives of the regions. Uh, I know from all the representatives uh, of regions around Europe, uh, they are in favour of this kind of regional policy because this is a guarantee for them to receive money for the regional development. The added value or the additional value, if you like, is uh, that there is money provided for seven years, which is completely different from a national budget, which is usually for one in some countries for two years. Obviously another problem is the European Union is getting larger, more countries coming in from Eastern Europe that are poorer, that could lead to being, there being less money for the North East, potentially in the future, couldn't it? Indeed, the main task of uh, European regional policy is to uh, reduce disparities between regions, but uh, additional members, in particular from the, from the former communist countries, are a huge market opportunity, for instance, for Great Britain and uh, its uh, companies, because uh, these are the emerging markets of Europe. Here we have significant, still significant increases of welfare level. People can consume more if there is uh, adequate support. And in that respect, uh, Britain, British companies, and therefore British jobs are uh, pushed by this kind of development. And this is a market opportunity we should take into account also in Britain. Britain 
has uh, some decisions to make potentially in the future. There may be a referendum on whether to stay in the European Union. Do you believe that a region like the North East, for instance, a poorer region, might suffer more if the UK lost the European Union, perhaps, than wealthier regions? If if UK would leave, uh, it would leave also the, the, the single market. And uh, this is something which should be taken into account. And uh, this is something which has to be discussed in the British public and to, to, to balance the pro and cons. And afterwards, uh, British people have to decide. But uh, the consequences are... Uh, there are a lot of consequences which would affect uh, um, every part of, uh, of, of UK and I would say the, the less developed even more than probably the more developed regions but uh, the less developed regions should have an interest to be part of Europe because only if you are in a big family you can benefit from the strength of a big family. Johannes Harnett. Uh, Jonathan Arnott, £500 million came to the North East from the EU in the last six years, another £600 million coming over the next six years. As the Commissioner said, creating jobs, you throw that all away. It's money that comes back from what we spend on our EU membership in the first place. So I asked the question, would you spend £20 to get a £10 Marks and Spencers voucher? And of course the European Union expects you to be grateful for the £10 voucher. It's completely ridiculous. But this is money that, as he says, is guaranteed for seven years. Are you saying UKIP would deliver that money to the North East, guarantee it for seven years? Well, I, I don't see that that makes much, much difference whether it's seven years or five years of the life of a parliament. But, uh, is it, is, it, UK, is it a UKIP commitment that uh, our share of that money will come directly to the North East to help the North East economy? Because that's what we're getting from the EU. Is UKIP offering that? We're saying, that, uh, we're saying that we should be helping the regions. We're not at a specific figure um, set at the moment. But, I mean, obviously we should make sure that projects that need to be funded are funded. But, of course, not all European Union funding is needed anyway because the money is going on things that they tell us how we must spend it. Uh, Duke Curtin Darling, I mean, imagine if your party got into government and could control this huge pot of money. You could do a lot of good in the North East. We, we certainly could, and I think uh, uh, regional economic devolution is, is part, uh, going to be part but, but of the Labour agenda. You're going to be all this money to the but, EU that's, but the as EU, Jonathan Arnott says, going to be partly paid back to us. Well, but those, those EU funds are not uh, determined, uh, the spending of those EU funds are not determined by Brussels, as UKIP are suggesting. Those are determined locally. Currently, the next seven years, like you said, it's actually £660 million um, pounds for the North East and the Tees Valley Leps. That will be decided by local business together with uh, local um, but, uh, other actors, how that money is spent best in the region. And I think the, the, the important The problem thing is, though, as, as we pointed out to the Commissioner, that that is going to dwindle as time goes on because mm. a lot of our money is going to end up funding Eastern European infrastructure rather than North East infrastructure. But there are, there are funds that we get from the structural funds, which is what you interviewed the Commissioner about, the regional funding and the social fund. But there are other funds that we get as a region as well from the Common Agricultural Policy, for example, which are about diversification in the rural economy. There are funds which come from the research budget, which go okay. into our universities, go into innovation. I think the key thing is switching all of that money through Westminster is very dangerous. Okay. Just okay. for the North East, right. okay. because we've seen what's happened with funding through this three-year okay. government. Actually, these regional funds are a win-win, Jonathan Arna, in that, uh, uh, as the Commissioner says, we get some money here, but they also develop Eastern European economies for British businesses. See, I, I don't see that developing economies in Eastern Europe is what uh, UK taxpayers' money should be spent on. I don't think that's an efficient use of, uh, of your taxes or my taxes. I think that, uh, that our taxes should be used, generally speaking, to, uh, to help people directly in the UK, which would be much more efficient, and where there is a case uh, for helping uh, foreign countries, things like natural disasters, that's the sort of thing that foreign aid should be for. Okay. It shouldn't be for going to other European countries. Okay, well, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there.